bread until the person that was born. We just laid there, cried, and wiggled. You know, the she moms work, did it all. Hard for that. I, tell, I get people my mom's phone numbers. They either call her and thank her, or call her and tell her she shouldn't have done it. Now, whichever way you want to go, <laughs> just say it. The moms did all the work. It's going up. Well, dad helped. It's not really. <laughs> Joy put uh, John fourteen twenty seven on the board. All right. John fourteen seven. Seven or twenty seven. Twenty seven. There you go. For a second, I had a. There it is. Yeah, here I have you. Know, I'm all ready to go, and all of a sudden, other scriptures start coming to mind. It's like, <gasps> so that's all right. We've got to walk and roll with the Holy Ghost. Amen? Father, we thank you for this time you give us to be together. We truly are thankful. I thank you for this building and this place, this property. I thank you for the heat in this room. I thank you for the hearts that are here tonight. Just not here in this place, but that are watching live by Facebook. I welcome all those that are listening. I pray that, that we all surrender our thinking to you. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you've granted us grace to repent. The ability to repent, to change the way we think. Man. And if we get the American stuff out, Get your word in. Maybe we begin to see your word the way we're supposed to see your word. May we be assimilated into your word instead of your, your word being assimilated into our culture. We want to become what your word says because we already are. May we look into this mirror and see ourselves the way you see us. And that's going to cause us to be transformed on the inside in our soul, our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, so we can look that way on the outside. May we, Holy Spirit, help us pray every night like David prayed, that when we lay our head on the pillow to go to sleep, that we look more like you when we wake up in the morning. Man, do a work in us that only you can do, and we allow you to do that. May we be moldable, teachable, shapeable, transformable. Be our teacher. Open the eyes of our understanding. Bring to us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of who you really are. And all God's people said, amen. amen and amen. I tell you what, uh, you know, every time I teach on the gospel of peace, and we usually always focus it around uh, Christ, the, the period of time when most of the world celebrates the, uh, uh, a season of Christ's birth. Uh, uh, you know, that's what it's really about. It's not about a mass for Christ, a Christ mass. It's Christ's birth. But we all know December 25th is not the day Jesus was born. But it's the season that, you know, I've had people talk to me about that, about different cultures and you know, pagan in, uh, introduction into to things and how uh, Constantine took paganism and, and uh, Christianity and, and mixed them together and uh, basically made a mess out of everything. And, and God, God has given me just a simple, this is, this is how joy and I handle things.
things, uh, whether it be Resurrection Day, some people call it Easter, we call it Resurrection Day, because it's not from Eshatar, or, uh, it's not, you know, it's not, and even, you know, there's no such, I, I'm a Good Wednesday person, you know what I mean by Good Wednesday? Some people probably don't even understand what I'm talking about when I say Good Wednesday, because uh, most people say Good Friday. You know, Good Friday, you've heard of Good Friday? Well, it really wasn't a Good Friday, it was a Good Wednesday. You know, there's not three days and three nights between Friday and Sunday morning. <laughs> it really is, biblically. But see, that's, 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 uh, that's where traditions of men have come in to make the Word of God of no effect. And we're not talking about it, but, but in everything, because we're, we come from a Gentile world, <laughs> There are th things that that the, that our calendar and our society and our culture are geared to. What we've decided to do as a family is take those back. You understand what I'm saying? We take them back. Just because the world or somebody in the world made a tradition doesn't mean we can't take th that period of time and bring it back to God. <clears throat> It's like the rainbow. Who created the rainbow? Was God. it the gays? No. Now, can, can I hear a big another? Gays did not invent the rainbow. They did not create the rainbow. Who created the rainbow? God, God did. Well, man, there's some Christians that they're scared to put a rainbow up because they're afraid to be identified as being gay. Take the rainbow back, church. You know what I'm saying? Take it back. You know, Christ, so any time, well, the way we look at it is any time the world sets apart time and gives people time off of work and you can get your family together, I don't care what the world calls it. it may call, they may call it Easter, I call it Resurrection Day. They may call it Christmas, uh, uh, we, we, you know, it's Christ, it, it may not be this even in the month, I mean, because we know when Christ was basically born, but that's an opportunity for you to get your family together and magnify God. And there's two simple things that God has given Joy and I in, in our family, and no matter what we do in the Gentile world, if we participate in it, are we magnifying are we magnifying Jesus? Probably not. No, Joy, that's a question we have. I'm not asking you. Oh. I'm asking what we do. Like Christ's birth. We, we, we don't say, you know, are, is, is, is Christ the center of what's been? Exodus, is that, is that magnifying Christ? Absolutely not. Is, is that anti-Christ? Anti See, that's anti-Christ. So there's two questions. Is what the world doing anti-Christ? And are you participating with something that's anti-Christ? Easter, bunnies and eggs. Is that anti-Christ? Yes, Absolutely. Is that magnifying what Christ has done for us at Calvary and the resurrection? No. no, it's not. So take every opportunity the world has to do. You take it back. You magnify God in it. You do what you... Take it back. Don't shy away from these things. Be a missionary in these things. Halloween. We don't celebrate Halloween. We, when we had a church, we had a worship night. It wasn't that we were identifying or doing something to acknowledge that day. We were taking that day back because we're supposed to worship every night. You know what I'm saying? We're supposed to give God glory every day. So in our festivals, in our feasts, and in our Sabbaths, Remember the scripture says, don't let anybody judge you. I'm on a little soapbox right now, but I'll get it over it. Don't let anybody judge you in moons and days and festivals and Sabbaths and feasts. And don't. You bring righteousness into it by bringing Christ into it. You take the opportunity. Man, if it's St. Patrick's Day, <coughs> you, you tell me you know, you've got someone better in your life than St. Patrick. It doesn't matter. You magnify Jesus that day. You bring Jesus into everything. Valentine's Day, you start talking about the love of God. You bring Jesus into it. Man, how many hearts do you see on Valentine's Day? Man, what a great time to tell people, you know, how Jesus came to heal the what? Broken hearted. And I tell you, 
I, I believe with all my heart that if we just magnify, if what we do is not anti-Christ, and if what we do magnifies Christ, we're good to go. I think God loves us. Amen? I, I believe that's the secret of living in the Gentile world is bring Christ into it. All right? Uh, let, let me bring this up because uh, the comment has come up, and I know it's uh, by other people have thought about this. And, uh, usually when we teach on the gospel of peace during the, this season of the year because we're focused on peace, and I believe it's really the message. Uh, the, it's not the nativity. It, it's the gospel of peace is the focus of, uh, I mean, 400 silent years went by between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and the first message from heaven is peace on earth and goodwill toward men. And so we bring up all the scriptures. Uh, there's so many scriptures that deal with peace, like this one says, peace, I, this is in red letters, so Jesus is saying this, and it says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give, give. you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let your what heart be let, let not, not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be what afraid. the very issue that they were dealing with uh, when the shepherds were abiding in a field and they were afraid. See, they weren't scared of the devil in the old covenant. The devil wasn't the focus in the old covenant. God was. They were scared of God. It wasn't the devil that killed 3,000 people the first day the law showed up. It wasn't the devil that kid, killed old buddy Uzo when he reached out to touch the, the Ark of the Covenant when it was starting to fall. It was God. And so we talk about this, and people always make the, and, and I really appreciate the way people ask the question because, you know, there's, there's a couple ways you can ask me questions about stuff. And, you know, I'll, I'll usually respond I wish I was just 100% spiritual, but I'm not. So if you were, if you ask the question, well, what about the scripture that says I didn't come to bring peace but a sword? You know, if you come at me this way, <laughs> you're going to reap what you sow. <laughs> I'm going to come back at you that way. But if you come to me and say, well, what about the scripture that says, and, and you really don't understand, you know, if you're trying to be controversial, I'll win. Okay? But what about the scripture that says, Jesus says, he says, I didn't come to bring so, uh, peace, but a sword. And we, we find that scripture. So let's talk about it real quick before we go any further. Uh, look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. By the way, everybody needs to say hi to Luann. Luann and Lenny are watching. <laughs> they heard, everybody say hi, Lenny and Luann. Hi, hi Lenny and Luann. Hi, Luann. I know you don't miss us. But that's okay. By the way, thanks for the wood. I didn't get half of it. I'll go back and get the rest of it later. Appreciate it, Becky. And hi, Vicki. She is watching too. All right. right. Let's go in here. It says, in verse 34, you got it up there? All right. Red letters. Who's saying this? Jesus. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace on, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father. A daughter against her mother, and a, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And what I want you to see here is that there's a pattern. Now, when Jesus said, I have come to bring a sword, what, we're going to get into what he came to do here in a second. So, when it says, what in Scripture, what does the Scripture say the sword is? Oh. No. The sword is the word of God. Word of God. The word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, right and dividing the soul of the spirit. It says in the book of Revelations that the sword is the word of God coming from your mouth. Yeah, but it's the word of God. Okay? And so what Jesus is saying here is, is I came to bring a sword, and what do swords do? The word of God is going to divide, and basically what it's saying, notice the pattern here? Father is going to divide the son from the father. Do you see that? Everybody shake your head if you see that. Yeah. It's going to divide the mother 
excuse me, here's the mother, and it's going to divide the daughter from the mother. It's going to bring separation from the mother-in-law from the daughter-in-law. So over here on this hand, we, we have old. Father, mother, mother-in-law. Over here, we have younger. Son, daughter, daughter-in-law. And Jesus was saying that the word, that the sword he was bringing, his word, was going to divide old from new. new. This literally is a reference to a, another reference in the many, many, many of dividing the old covenant from the new covenant. Jesus knew that the word he was going to bring was a new covenant word. And there was a group of people that were we're not going to be able to receive his new new word, his new message, the kingdom of heaven message. They weren't going to be able to receive it, and the younger that could receive it would be divided from that. And it's two things. So it's, it's the old and new covenant being divided, and it's also understanding that his word, his message, the gospel, that was his message, was the gospel, was going to divide people's theology. There's going to be some that stick under the law and some are going to be freed from it. Man, that's power. That's power. So, to find out exactly what Jesus came to do, and he came to do many things, but the Bible makes it perfectly clear. Turn, turn with me to the book of 1 John chapter 3. And we could go out throughout scripture and talk about all the different things that Jesus came to do, but th th this makes it pretty simple. And uh, we'll get into this, and I'm, I'm going to go slower. We started the introduction last week. I can slow down. And uh, we had a great time, by the way, uh, a Saturday night in Fergus Falls. Jerry was there. Thank you, Jerry, for coming that far, even though you paid the price for it on the way home. Uh -huh. <laughs> Jerry, Jerry drove all the way out to Fergus Falls just so he could bless everybody with uh, his uh, gift. part of Joyce Worship Team playing the guitar. And, and uh, oh dear. I'm really like, oh dear. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, or the deer hit me. Yeah, the deer hit me. The side of my deer. So, well, thank you for that sacrifice, dear. So, we're, we're going to get into, we're not going to get into all of this. We've done this before, time and time again. And please don't get, uh, uh, he, I want you to hear one of the things uh, we try to communicate to people. Even though details are important, don't get me wrong, details are important. But don't miss the concept because of details. You understand what I'm saying? You know, when Jesus was speaking about the kingdom of heaven, when he was talking to farmers, he said, hey, you know what? The kingdom of heaven is like unto this. It wasn't. And then when he's talking to fishermen, yeah, you know, the kingdom of heaven, it's like unto this. And he was talking, you know, so depending on the group of people that he was talking to, he put the gospel of, of the kingdom of heaven in a way that they, in a vernacular that they could understand and relate to. And so, you, can, you know, and, and he left the room open for personal understanding and application. You know, if, if, if the details make it so unapplicable, what good are the details? You understand what I'm saying? The word of God has to be applicable or it's no good. Don't you, what the you, 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 you have to uh, you have to understand the concept. Details are important, but not more important than the message. Got it? So I'm just gonna say it that way. And so don't get caught up in the in the details, even though details are important. Listen to what this is saying. First John chapter 3, we're going to start with verse 4. It says, whoever commits sin. Now, I did this at Saturday night, and I forgot to explain. So if you were there Saturday night in Fergus Falls, or if you were listening on Facebook Live, uh, we went. We started in First John 1. Don't, don't turn there, Joy. And we went through here and talked about sin. It says, if you say, if you say that you have no sin, you're a liar and you deceive yourself. And I usually have everybody raise their hand if they sin, and everybody raises their hand. But when you get down to the nitty-gritty, 
when you read to help you understand First John one not a uh, one First John one and chapter two and chapter three. Every time I say the word sin, you're thinking of a verb, the action, something you did or something you did not do. Uh, and in, in this passage, in these passages of scripture, sin is mentioned in two ways. One is a noun and one is a verb. And so when you see, you have to understand which, which uh, what type of sin are you talking about? It's not talking about like, uh, is, it, is this the action it's talking about? So in other words, if you confess, it doesn't say if you confess your sins. In other words, I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this. And have a list. That he's faithful and just to forgive you of all your unrighteousness. No, it's saying if you confess that you're a sinner. See, you don't have to list all your sins you've ever done. He's forgiven. You confess. If it's, the scripture goes on 1 John 1, 9, it says, if you say you're not a sinner, you deceive yourself. See, it's not saying you have not sinned, but you're not a sinner. It's a noun. It's a subject of sin. Talking about a sinner. And some of them are verbs. And so you need to go through there and mark which ones are nouns and which ones are verbs. So <coughs> to make this clear, let us just, uh, since we said that, let's go to verse 4 in chapter 3. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is what? Lawlessness. And you know that he was, talking about Jesus, was what? Manifested. Again, every Monday night, I, I know other people in the world don't know this, but every Monday night when we teach here, it's national, across the board, Crowd Participation Day, national. So when I pause and you're reading up here, and I say, and you know that he was, and I pause, even on Facebook Live, you can say, manifested, yeah. when I sit out, so I can hear that you're awake and you're listening, all right? Yeah. So it says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness, and you know that he was manifested to take away our sin. Yeah. Man, that was the purpose of Jesus, was to take away our sin. And it's actually an enough. Our sin nature, the subject of sin. Not all your little bitty individual, little bitty ones, but your very nature. Man, you stop. See, and we'll, we'll get into this as we go along. Just, I'll have to hopefully stick with this. It says, He was manifested to take away our sin, sin nature. Our sin is the subject of sin. I, I ask the question all the time when I go. Usually when I go to the new church, how many sinners saved by grace? You know how many hands go up? All of them. That's what they've been taught. They're sinners saved. No. I said, no, you were a sinner that was saved by grace. But now that you've been saved by grace, now you're safe. You're a king's kid. You can't, you, your actions don't make you what you are. Who you are determines your actions. That's why I tell people, when you understand, when you get a revelation of righteousness in your heart, Righteousness is not it's not going to want to sin. You're not going to want to go out and do the stuff you used to do when you had an unrighteous heart. Because righteousness is in the heart. It's in the heart. And when you have a righteous heart, you're going to live righteous. You're going to do righteous. You're going to, your want-tos are going to change. You're not, you're not going to want to do the things you used to do when you did, had an unrighteous heart. Now people say, well, you're just telling people great grace is just setting people free to, to, to sin. You're free to sin anyway. The law never kept you from sinning. Got a question. How many people out there in Facebook land have ever heard a message about it, about hell, fire, and brimstone, and the eternal judgment of God? Everybody raise your hand if you ever heard that. Has that kept you from sinning? No. Why don't we try the love of God, the grace of God, God's ability working in us with a righteous heart, letting your heart understand who you are in Christ Jesus, and you're not going to want to no more. I love the story of Jesus in the temple, the, the woman caught in adultery. Uh, came, uh, they brought, brought her to him, and uh, we're not going to know the whole story, but he turns, after he stands up, and there's no, no accusers there, he turns to her and says, 
Woman, where's your accusers? What does she say? There are none. Are none, Lord. Go and sin no more. He said, I don't accuse you either, so go and sin no more. He didn't say, woman, did you do it? <laughs> he never asked the question. He didn't put the word guilt in our heart. He said, I don't accuse you either. He said, a freedom. And it was in that freedom that was placed in our heart. Then he said, now, with that freedom, go and live like you've never lived before. With the power of what Jesus, see, Jesus healed her broken heart right there. Jesus came to do what we read last week. We're going to read it again tonight. In, in, in the book of Luke, chapter 4, it says, He came to heal the broken. Don't change it. He came to heal the what? Hearted. The broken hearted. Jesus' ministry is about healing. The reason she had committed adultery with, some, with a man is because she had a heart issue that had to be healed. Jesus healed that heart right then and set her free from ever doing that again. The problem is we haven't let Jesus heal our heart. We don't understand the power of the cross, the power of Jesus in our life, and our heart. Say heart. Heart. Yeah, that's powerful. So it says here, verse 5 again, and you know that he was manifested. What was Jesus? He was manifested to take away our sins. And in him, say in him. In him. How many people are in Christ? I tell you, in him there is no sin. Now, for us to understand this, let me go ahead and read the rest of this. Whoever abides in him, no, in him there's what? No sin. Say it. No sin. That's a noun. In him there's no sin. And the very next says, whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him or what this is. See, you've got to get away from the verb. It says, it says, whoever abides in him is not a sinner. Whoever is a sinner has neither seen him nor Know him. It does, listen, the scripture says this that even if we sin after being born again, we have an advocate with the Father. And that's Jesus Christ. So he's not talking about the what's happening in the flesh the way you see it. This is talking about what's happened in the spirit, in the spirit realm that you can't see. To understand scripture, you must understand spirit, soul, and body. To understand the kingdom of heaven, you have to understand spirit, soul, and body. And to understand eschatology, you have to understand spirit, soul, and body. And just not what Americans read in scripture but Jewish culture and Jewish calendar. I, I rarely, if ever, hear of anybody teaching an eschatology that has all these verses out here in scriptures. And I explained it to people in uh, Fergus Falls that uh, eschatology is like uh, a, a kaleidoscope. And as long as the cross is in the middle, of the lens of kaleidoscope, and if I, uh, not a uh, kaleidoscope has has three mirrors on the inside, and you can say Father, Son, Holy Spirit if you want to. It's kind of cool. And and as you turn it, the little in all the scriptures pertaining to to eschatology is in there in a different color. And as you turn it, you're looking at the kaleidoscope, and you turn it, and every every little thing changes. That's the way people are with eschatology. You got all these scriptures. I've heard. I've heard many people, lots of people, take one scripture and some of them use it here, some use it here, and some use it here. It's like turning, and it all comes out different. <laughs> you take four or five scriptures and you move them around, it's a different picture. That's why some people believe in this, some people believe in this, some people believe in this, and, and some people believe in this, and they all swear they know what they're talking about until they turn the kaleidoscope, changes the picture. <clears throat> you know, it's like, 
But if you understand, you start bringing the Jewish culture and the calendar that God gave the Jews to prepare them for his second coming. Um, it, it makes a whole big difference. The same thing with scripture. You have to understand spirit, soul, and body. And we're going to keep reading this. It says this. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. You know, and I have people say all the time, see, it says practice. I understand what it's saying. Don't miss the concept because of the detail. Why was Jesus manifested? To take away sin. Don't skip that part. Don't skip that. It's talking about practice. But then you've got to get into well, what's the definition of practice sin. I mean, see, they're still arguing about working on the Sabbath. There's no clear definition picture of what it means to work on the Sabbath. They're still arguing over that. You understand that? Or did everybody think that the Jews had it down pat? They're still arguing over it. You know, well. Is it even viable? <laughs> you know, well, no, I'm just you know, bringing it up. Little children, let no one deceive you. Who practices righteousness is righteous. Just as he is righteous. You've got a question for those that believe this is, well, you got to be right. If you practice righteousness, but you don't believe in Jesus, are you righteous? Nope. No. Thank you. <laughs> Practicing it is not what makes you righteous. Knowing it in your heart, it's a, out of your heart you're going to live. The more you know you're righteous, so, see, I believe the people that are born again that ha are having problems with sin in their life don't understand how righteous they already are. And they're feeling guilty about what they're doing in the flesh because they're always looking. And again, I, I told you about, I got a friend of mine who wrote a book that says, says, sin's not the issue, it's the problem. Righteousness is the issue, but sin gets in the way of us seeing ourselves righteous. It's the problem. Did Jesus bring up the sin to the woman that was caught in adultery in the temple? No. I'm sorry. I'm getting on my soapbox. The pulpit again. <laughs> Little children that no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. He who sins, say it this way, he that is a, a sinner because how many people sin? The Bible says if we sin as a believer, we have an advocate with the Father. So there's still sin going on, but it's talking about your nature. If your nature is sinner, if you're after Adam, if you're still after Adam, if you're still under the blood of Adam, you have to be under the blood of Christ. If you're still under the blood of Adam, you're a sinner, even if you practice righteousness. Got it? This passage of scripture is more about Jesus being manifested to take away our sin nature, sin in itself. Then I tell you, I just want to, I'm going to be pounding on this pulpit shortly. It says, he who sins is of the devil, for the devil has what? Sin. sin. That's a verb. That word sin is a verb. It means the devil's action his action. Where did, where did he sin? In the beginning. Where's the beginning? Where's the beginning? Say in the garden. In the garden. Man, I tell you, we, we could get into this really good and, and has a lot of fun in this. But was was and what's it say here? What's it say? The devil has sinned. Was the devil in heaven? Or was Lucifer in heaven? Lucifer. Lucifer was. Luc did God create the devil? I, I mean, we're, we're, this is for now, he created Lucifer. The, 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 the people yeah. that said this is for Bible nerds. Not everybody needs to know this. So if you're not interested, just close your ears and don't listen. All right. See, God created Lucifer, but where did the devil come from? Lucifer turned into the devil. Lucifer turned into the. How did that happen? It happened at the garden. The, the Bible tells us in Ezekiel 28 how. Beautiful, magnificent, and then when he was found in his heart, and then he sinned in the garden when he 
he, he deceived Eve and manifested his iniquity. And he deceived Eve. He sinned in the beginning. And when man gave, when Adam gave the authority over, the authority that God gave him, when he gave it, he became, that's when he became, that's when even Jesus says Satan is the God of this world. The devil has sinned from the beginning, but Lucifer, his name was changed. Lucifer's name was changed from Lucifer to the devil and Satan. Saul's name was changed from Saul to Paul. Start looking at scriptures and all the times when people's names were changed. Abram became Abraham. Sarai became Sarah. And every time somebody's name was changed, something happened in their heart. Something happened to cause the name to be changed. Man. Every time there's a name change, there's a story to be understood. That's what Bible nerds. Sometimes some bad decisions wow. can bring it back. Every time. That's power. That's a whole. That's a whole teaching and understanding all on its own, right there. Question: Has your name been changed? Has something happened in your heart? Have you gone from being a sinner to a saint, a child of God? Are you still under your old family, or you have have you adopted a new family name? Just saying. Is Adam still your father, or is God your father? It can't be both. The gospel is not about making the sin nature better. It's about becoming a new creature in Christ. The old things have passed away, all things have become new. We won't get in. Let's go on. Little children, verse 7, let no one deceive you. Who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning for this purpose. The Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born again, can I say it that way? Born from above, born from or born of God, does not sin. That is a noun. It's not a verb. It doesn't mean you're not going to mess up. Because if you mess up, you have an advocate with the Father to make to take care of the mess up. Jesus is our advocate. You understand this? It's not saying you're not going to sin again. It says you're not going to be a sinner when you sin again. Oh. That's good, Dan, right there. You know what I'm saying? Most of them. Oh. That means I that, gotta mess with that them. means that when you sin, you're not going to be a sinner. You can't be, if you're born from God, you can't be a sinner. Your sin doesn't make you a sinner. You don't lose. Adam did. You don't lose your sonship. Oh, come on. Man, that's the gospel. That's the word. This, this whole passage of scripture is pointed to the cross. Does everybody understand that? Jesus was manifested to what? Take away the sin. That he might destroy the works of the devil. And what and did the what has the what did the devil do from the very beginning? Sin. Sin. Sin is not a product of God's creation, people. He didn't create sin. Man did. God didn't give Satan the authority. 
your thought or your atom. Don't blame it on the woman. <laughs> that's why, oh, that's why you're not married. You're not, you got no one to blame, Jerry. <laughs> Man, I tell you, that's powerful right there. I, I shouldn't have, I, I've pulled on so long on this, I hadn't even got to the good stuff. So turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Before we read 21, we have to go back to 14. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves. I'm going to say this right here. Quit living let me, let me put this. The more you live for yourself, the more you make decisions where it's just you involved in it, the less you understand what Christ has done for you. The fewer people you have in your life, the less you understand the abundant life that Jesus came to bring you. Jesus said he came to bring us life and life more abundant. abundant. As we grow older, we should have more influence in people's lives than we had yesterday when we were younger. That's the importance of being grandparents. You really should have more grandchildren than you had children. You might have screwed up with your children, but you know better now. You've got grandchildren. You can plant seed. You can love them. Isn't it easier to love your grandchildren unconditional? <laughs> that it is your children were. <laughs> they just go oh, in. Yeah. Children are hard to love unconditional, but grandchildren, ah, no, they're not. No, they're not. <laughs> Come here, give me a hug. And you say, well, it'll be okay. Why? Because it was okay in your life. You just didn't know it when it happened. You know you worked through the problems. You know, it, it, it's going to be okay. This too shall what? Pass. Just keep God in the center. Keep God in the focus. I'm sorry, I'm mad with you. But I can do that. I'm at home. Verse 16. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. This is in the realm of the spirit. These are these verses that I was trying to share with you. If you don't understand spirit, soul, and body, you will not know. You say, well, I'm not new. Yes, you are. In the spirit, you're new. In God's eyes, you're new. God has done a work in you. He is already sanctified. God desires that we be sanctified, spirit, soul, and body. That's what it says in Thessalonians. It says God desires that we be sanctified, spirit, soul, and body. He's already sanctified the spirit, man, with the work of Christ. Now, our soul needs to be sanctified. Our thoughts, our feelings. If you try to sanctify your flesh without sanctifying your soul, you ain't going to work. You're going to be frustrated. You're going to give up. If you try to live, you try to live sinless on the outside without knowing that you're righteous on the inside, if you still see yourself as a sinner, guess what? Guess what the most natural thing for a sinner to do sin. is? It's sin. It becomes natural. It's easy. That's why babies are selfish. When they come out, they're selfish. They're not thinking about their mother in their sleep. They want to eat. They want to nap. They don't care what time it is. They're born with that nature. So your nature has to change and not be selfish. Therefore, verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new cre creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of what? Reconciliation. That is, and we're talking, I'm just going to keep going. That is that. God was in Christ, reconciling the whole world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. Why, what, did, what was the purpose of the law? The law came. See, they were sin in the world. You understand that? 
Before the law came, sin was in the world, but it wasn't imputed. You weren't responsible for your sin. The Bible says that the law came so you would be responsible for your sin. It was put on you. The law put your actions on you. Okay? That was the purpose of the law. The purpose of grace, the purpose of the work of Christ, is to impute righteousness. Not because of what we did, but because, see, if you believe in what Christ has done, righteousness is imputed on you. Just like if you lived under the law, the law imputed your sin, your wrongness. Well, under grace, under the new covenant, righteousness is imputed on you. You understand? So let's go on. It says, therefore, if anyone is a new creation, all things have passed away, all things have become new. Uh, now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the whole world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. What's the say? He's not imputing there's, see, the, we've been told that sin, God dealt with sin through Jesus Christ. We're going to read, we're gonna, when we get down to 21, we'll, we'll go back and talk about all this. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. That's powerful. And has committed us to the word of what? Recon so in other words, their job was to go around and tell people and you'll find out if I get done with scriptures. It says that Paul said that he was uh, anointed to preach the gospel. The gospel is the cross. This is, the, this is what happened at the cross. This is Calvary. While Jesus was on Calvary dying, and it, well, let me just, verse, well, let's keep reading. Verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, and though as though God were what? Pleading. Man, hear the passion in that. Quit reading the details. I don't want to say don't, don't ignore the details, but feel the passion in Scripture. Feel the emotion. This word was written with emotion. We just make it religious. It's text. No, it's heart. Feel the heart in this. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Wait a minute, I thought we said we were reconciled to God. Didn't it just say that God was reconciling the whole world to himself? Yeah. Now you be reconciled to him. Is it God's will that all men be saved? Yes. Are all men going to be saved? No. no. Is it God's will that all men be healed? Yes. Is it God's will that all men live on earth whole? Yes. Yes. Are all men going to be healed? Are all men going to live whole? Nope. But to them that believe. See, only if you believe what God's done for you are you going to receive it. Just like in salvation, it's God's will that all men be saved. And in Christ, he, he forgave the whole world of all their sins and don't, he doesn't hold their sin against them anymore because he dealt with sin at Calvary. We're going to get that in a second. So their ministry, their gospel that Paul was preaching was to tell the world, he's imploring people, listen, God has forgiven you of all your trespasses. Now you believe what he's done for you and receive it. We need to quit telling the world they're guilty. Your sin is not separating God from you. Your sin is separating you from God. The scripture says sin wars against your soul. It doesn't war against God. He dealt with it. See, God has always loved man. That's why he made him. 
He didn't make man to go to heaven. He made man to be on earth. To walk in the cool of the evening and have a relationship. And then sin got in the way. He's always loved man, but he's hated sin. So he had to deal with sin. So in Genesis chapter 3, God gave the prophetic word of what was going to happen in the future. That the God of peace was going to send his prince of peace to establish peace on earth through his son at Calvary. And while his son was at the cross, <coughs> what, what's it say here? Verse 21. For he made him who knew no sin, that was Jesus, to what? Yes, yes. Jesus was never a sinner. It says that he took on the sin in his flesh, in his soul, <coughs> and not his spirit. Jesus' body literally became sin. All of it. He didn't become, and, and, and I know this written in the book, and I, uh, I listen, I just say it different than, than in the book that I really appreciate and, and I actually promote a whole lot. Uh, and Jesus never became a homosexual. You understand that? But he, his, he, he took became, on homosexuality. He took on homosexuality. On his flesh. He never became one. He never took on, he was never a murderer. He took on murder. He became murder. He became lying. He became homosexuality. He became lust. He became the sins, all the sins of the world. And God hung those sins on the cross and poured out his judgment and his wrath for all man's sin that started at the Garden of Eden when the devil sinned in the beginning and caused man to sin. Because Jesus was manifested to, to destroy the The work of the devil. He destroyed sin. The reason we don't walk in victory as believers is because we don't understand in our heart really the exchange process that took place at Calvary. We think that Jesus saved us, but we still have to. He set you free from sin of the world. You are the, the book of Galatians says it this way: stand fast. In the liberty in which Christ has made us free. We're free from sin in the spirit. See, I, I can hear people. So as I said, that people are going, well, how come I still have a problem? It's in your flesh. It's a heart issue. It's not a spiritual issue. Because if you've been born from above, you can't be a sinner. But your flesh is going to mess up. And when your flesh messes up, you have an advocate with the Father that reminds you that your sin's been paid for. Quit living in the problems that your sin produced. Quit it. You're free. The Apostle Paul said this at the end of his ministry. I've got a question. Is murder and killing a sin. Say yes. Is it against the Ten Commandments? Say yes. Thou shalt not what? Murder. No. And what was he doing to the church? <laughs> he was killing the church. The people. But he was under the law, but he felt he was doing God a favor. Was he breaking the law when he was killing Christians? <laughs> At the end of his ministry, he says this. Now I know. I've been delivered. Excuse me. I'll say it this way. The way it said. Now I know that I'm innocent of all Of all the people he killed, 
he now knew he was. I didn't say not guilty. See, not guilty means there wasn't enough evidence to prove you did it. Innocent means there's no accusation. In his heart, through the process of grace that he was preaching, the gospel of the cross, the same message that Jesus was teaching, he talked to Paul after he was converted from Saul to Paul. When he got the grace in his heart and he took that message of the cross to the Gentile world, not the law, but the message of grace. He didn't put them under the law of the Jews. He put them on the, see, Romans, they put Romans 8, chapter 2 on the scripture. This is my favorite. We're going to go over this every week, hopefully. It says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. What Jesus did for us up at Calvary by becoming sin. See, I should I, I didn't have time to get into it, but we were we were going to matter of fact we, we need to read it. We, but turn me to First Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter one. Gotta read this, gotta read this, gotta read this. Verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the what? Gospel. The gospel. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, least the cross of Christ. See, the gospel is the cross of Christ. The cross of Christ is the gospel. But the, cross, the gospel that we've heard is not necessarily the gospel that they were preaching. We've heard a different gospel that kept sin alive. The gospel that they were preaching showed that Jesus became sin and he was manifested to destroy the work of the devil which was sin got a question great deep theological question did Jesus accomplish what he came to do at Calvary yes, yes. yes. or no yes, yes he did if the answer is yes then the work of the devil was destroyed in the spirit. Amen. You've got to be reconciled to God. Believe what he's done. Find righteousness in your heart. What does Romans 10, 9, and 10 say? Put that on the verse real quick. Romans 10, 9, and 10. Salvation scripture. You need to see this. You need to see this. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you shall be what? Saved. Saved. Verse 10. For with the heart, say heart. Heart. One believes under what? Righteousness is a heart issue. Not a head issue. It's a heart. The more you understand your righteousness that's in the heart, the more salvation you're going to experience. Oh, how does it say that? For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto what? Salvation. Salvation is something. Salvation is the fruit of your righteousness that you experience on earth. Righteousness is in your heart and in your spirit, and as out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth is going to what? Speak. Speak. You're going to confess what's in your heart because what's in the spirit established, and you're going to begin to see it. Salvation is what you live in on earth, not what you live in heaven. I'm going to go ahead and read this. Verse 17 in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For this message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being what? Saved. saved. It doesn't say for us that are saved. It doesn't say for us that are saved. No, being saved. Saved, salvation is a process. It's not a one time out of your mouth experience that lasts for eternity. 
Salvation is an ongoing experience where the word of God is now being imparted into your heart and your soul that renews your mind, and you're not being transformed by the, uh, you're not being changed by the world, you're being transformed by the word of God in your life, and now you're experiencing, you're becoming whole. It's already taken place in the spirit. So the word salvation is a perfect tense word. It's past, present, and future, future and all ongoing. at the same time. You were saved, you're being saved, and you've yet to be saved. Does you understand that? Another scripture, put Hebrews chapter 10, verse 39 on the board, real quick. We need two computer operators, real quick. <laughs> Hebrews 10, 39. But we, now the, who wrote the book Hebrews? We think uh, Paul. We think Paul did, but let's just go ahead and just say this. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, that's destruction, what this is saying, we are not of those who go back under the law, because that's destruction. We are not of those who draw back or go back. He's talking to Hebrew people that have been born again. But we are not of those who draw back to destruction, but of those who believe to the saving of our soul. The Apostle Paul will say his soul is still being saved. He's not going to go, go back and live under the law. He is going to receive more and more of the grace of God in his life until his soul, his thoughts, his feelings, and emotions, his will line up to the truth that's been in the Spirit. And this happened to him at the end of his ministry when he said, I'm innocent. He understood to the degree of the grace of God in his heart about how righteous he was. He was innocent of the blood of all the men of Jews. How come no one brings up Saul and breaking the Ten Commandments by killing people? He was in favor of the, 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 the temple priests were excited what he was doing. <clears throat> well, you shouldn't do that, Paul. You're breaking the Ten Commandments. Let me read this again. Man, this is so good. Where are you now? Verse 18. First Four. Corinthians? Yeah. For the message of the cross is foolishness. I'm going to say it this way. I, I'm going to say it this way. Now, this may be a detail. You may not like the way it comes out. You can read it. Uh, but this is the way I read it. Since I know the, the, the group of people he was talking to in Hebrews, I mean, in Corinthians, uh, he's, he's saying here, for this, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are, who are perishing. Who's perishing? Everybody that doesn't believe in the grace of God, in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, in the work that was done at Calvary. If you don't believe the gospel, if you're still under the law, this message of the cross is full. You know, there's people who have been saved all their life think that the message that we're sharing is, full, is foolishness. Sure. For the message of the cross is foolishness. Is it foolish to think that everything depends upon Jesus and Calvary? No. No, it's not foolish. I hear people say, well, do you believe in Jesus paid the price for sin? Yes or no? Yes. But, they always add something there. But now we have to live this way. Have to? If you have to, you're not free. Only when you're free can you respond to what Jesus has done for you. You want to. You want to. The church of the want to. Man. It becomes a natural response. want to sit. So you realize some people still have to? Because they're under the law. The scripture says the law will make you sin. The more law you're under, the more sin you're going to be under. Don't touch it. It just gets very deeper. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who what? Are being saved. It is the power of God. It's the power of God. If you don't have the power of God in your life, 
not have the message of the cross, which is freedom from sin, because it, the devil was destroyed. Sin was destroyed. Jesus was manifested. I don't, it doesn't matter what you, theological people out there are, hey, well, listen, the scripture says that Jesus was manifested to destroy the work of the devil. Did he accomplish that? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Then hush up. Ask the Holy Spirit to teach you. I don't have the wisdom of words to convince. I don't want to convince people. I want the Holy. I want to challenge your mind so you go to God and go, oh my goodness, God, will you please show me what is true and let that truth set you free. Don't believe something because I say it in a way that makes you. I don't want, I'm not selling the gospel. It has to be revealed. But here's a little statement I learned a long time ago. I got a scripture for this. I'm not going to turn to it, but it says, basically it says this in the scripture. If righteousness is not revealed, you'll work for it. And if you work for it, you'll never find it. In the New Covenant, you can't work for righteousness. If it's not revealed, I literally, people say, what do I got? I've been doing the church all, this is the hardest thing for people to understand that people have been in church all their life. I tell people sometimes they've been in church all their life, the best thing they can do is quit going to church. Because <laughs> that's what screwed them up. I'm serious. Where did Paul go? Did Paul go to church? When he got changed from Paul to Saul, or Saul to Paul, Saul to Paul? He ended up in jail. No, he took off and went three years by himself with Jesus. Yeah. Some of us need to quit listening to the junk we've been listening to and take the word of God and just read the book of Romans. Because you're a Gentile. The book of Romans was written to the Gentiles, people in Italy. Just read the book of Romans. And Ephesians. Read Paul's letters to the Gentiles. That's who we are. Or were. Read, read, read Paul's letters to all the Gentile churches. He says it, in, you know, he says the same thing in Corinthians he says in Romans. Same message. Gentiles. And there is a freedom to be had. Through Christ. Stand fast in the liberty in which Christ has made us free. Father, we thank you for this time you give us to be together. Holy Spirit, you are the great teacher. May we take the time May we take the time that you've given us to hear what you're saying through your word not what we're told your word says. Faith comes by hearing. Faith doesn't come from being told. May we hear your word again for the first time. Holy Spirit, be our teacher. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.